Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading True Hiking Horror Stories. I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. We once found some young scouts, 9 to 11 years old, stumbling around in the woods after dark, completely lost, no lights, one sleeping bag between the two of them. They had taken a wrong turn into a dried creek bed that wasn't a trail, and just gotten completely lost. If they hadn't happened to be making a lot of noise stumbling around in the dark next to our tent, they would have had a really crappy night all alone in the woods. Luckily for them, we had helped some other lost kids earlier that day, and we got a look at their map. We happened to know where the group was staying, and walked the boys back to their friends. Even 20 years later, I still feel bad for those boys. The younger kid was bawling his eyes out, and the older kid was just barely keeping his stuff together. What the heck was that scout leader thinking, letting all of these inexperienced little kids wander around, with no supervision? or guidance. I was hiking with my girlfriend, her sister, and her boyfriend in Hawaii in 2021. We parked our car at the end of the road about 200 feet away from the trailhead behind the only other car at the end of the road, where another couple was getting ready to start the same hike. We briefly chatted with them as we got our shoes on and prepared our bags. They then started up the trail, and we followed maybe 10 minutes after they started. We figured we would maybe see them at the slide, which indicated the turnaround point. For context, the trail we were hiking led to a water slide deep in the mountains, which was the remnants of an old irrigation canal from the plantation era. The trail meandered through the rainforest, occasionally crossing and traversing the concrete irrigation canal, and led us to some large pipes spanning across a small valley, then directly into the mountain wall. This is where the trail forked. You could either follow the canal through the mountain in the dark, or traverse around the ridge to the slide. My girlfriend and I took the canal through the mountain, and her sister and boyfriend opted for traversing the trail. We both made it to the slide, and we didn't see the couple there. There were only two main trails that we knew of that connect to the slide, and we didn't see the couple returning from the slide in the opposite direction. We didn't think much of it at the time, because maybe they had taken a third route back, or had continued further up past the canal past the slide. But no one really does that based on the info from a few locals who have hiked the trail several times. We made our way back to the trailhead and still no sign of them. Their car was still there parked in front of ours. We still aren't sure what happened to them. They just totally vanished off the trail. Not super scary, but it definitely makes you wonder where they might have gone when considering the only ways to and from the trailhead. I just had a relatively creepy backpacking experience this weekend, which got me curious about what other folks have encountered while backpacking. I'll start sharing my experience. A friend and I did a brief two-night trip out of Sky Kamash, Washington, in the Central Cascades. We hiked in and set up camp at a beautiful subalpine lake. Everything was good up until dark, of course. I awoke around 1 a.m. to hear what sounded like branches breaking in the near distance. I initially thought that it sounded like branches on the ground being stepped on, but figured it could be branches breaking away from the tree, too. To keep my freaked out mind from going wild, I told myself that it was probably just an elk. This went on until I finally fell asleep again. The same thing happened the following night. 
but to make things worse, I heard what sounded like the zipper on our rain fly being unzipped as slowly as humanly possible, or like something very small was being drug across the fly of the tent very slowly. Either way, I flipped around on my horrifically squeaky inflatable pad in hopes of scaring off whatever it was, if anything at all. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night, but thankfully found that the zipper was fully closed at dawn. I've heard that temperature changes can cause cracking sounds within the bark of trees, but then again, a Google search on branches breaking in the woods pointing me to Bigfoot, but who knows. Either way, this creeped me out. I've never once heard sounds like that when backpacking, and I'm often awake several times during the night on trips. I was on Poo Poo Point in Issaquah, Washington a couple of weeks ago, and I hear twigs breaking left and right from an area behind me. I figured it was a paraglider who landed short of the landing area and was coming up on the trail. Imagine my surprise when a bear popped up 15 feet away from me. We looked at each other for a few brief seconds, and I let out the loudest hey bear, and he trundled off. I was shaking for the next 10 minutes. I've run into a lot of bears in the Enchanted Valley, but when you don't expect one, they can be a bit interesting. Last year in summer, I decided to spend one night in the wild in a nearby forest. So I packed my stuff and some food and went to the place in the evening. It was only a half an hour walk from my flat, and it wasn't the first night out in the wild on my own without a tent. So I ate some dinner and put my sleeping place up. When it was dark, I started to sleep, but the night was very uncalm. Somehow I couldn't get very good sleep. I woke up all the time, probably because it was quite close to the city, and I could still hear cars and people partying. So at around 4 o'clock, I decided that I will pack my stuff up and go home, so I can at least get some good sleep. When I was on my way back, still in the forest, I saw a person, probably male, standing on the path that I wanted to go on. He was just standing there with the back to me, not moving or walking. This was already scary, so I tried talking to him, asked who he is and if he could turn around, but he didn't move at all. I continued talking to him, that he should please talk to me or turn around or do anything. I tried it in two different languages, but he didn't react at all. He was just standing there, not moving. I waited and talked to him for at least 10 minutes, really scared. Then at one point he started walking very slowly in the direction that I wanted to go to. So I know, if I go the same way, I rather had to walk very slow or overtake him and be close to him at one point. So I decided to walk another way, which was a detour of at least 30 to 45 minutes. In the end, I knew that our paths will cross one last time, but at this time I could already see the city. But luckily, I didn't meet him again. He was probably high, but it was very scary since it was in the night and dark and he wasn't reacting or moving at all. I was hiking with a buddy near Tupper Lake. We were sitting in a fire tower watching the sunset and had just said goodbye to a young couple. About two minutes after they leave the peak, a blood-curdling scream fills the air. Keep in mind, they walked for two minutes. We were 50 feet in the air, and the wind was blowing towards them at about 20 miles per hour. My buddy and I looked at each other scared out of our minds, with zero idea of what to do. We came for the sunset, so we stayed for the sunset. Figuring if it was our last time to leave this earth, 
we would do so with the image of an ADK sunset fresh in our minds. After the sun ends, we start walking down the trail with sticks in hand just freaking out. We walk for about five minutes and figure that we're probably good and just scaring ourselves. The rest of the hike down was unnerving at best. The woods are never comfy at night past the range of your light. We get to the bottom and my buddy says, yo, there's another car here. When we came, there was only one car, a red one with a dude in it. The other girl showed up separately. She was the one that screamed. Her car was still here. His was gone. We ran to our car, hop in and start driving home. At this point, we were seriously considering calling the cops. As we're driving, we are past and it's the red car. I swung the car around, followed him back to the lot, and drive past the lot as his interior cab lights turn on. It's just him. No girl. To this day, we have no idea what happened. What we do know is that we told the guy in passing that we're going to camp Bridge Brooks Island, and the next night we did. We swore that we were being watched the entire night, with a big scare coming from our boat hitting rocks and sounding like a guy running up on us. I took an ill-advised winter hike in a storm. The wind was coming off the peak and down the ridge that I was ascending. There was snow on my ridge that was about shin deep, and we had about 800 feet to the summit. It was getting dark, and the wind lulled. We both heard a long, terrible scream up ahead, really tortured. The wind picked up again. We rejected the attempt and made our way back to the tent. I thought I could hear a helicopter in and out of the wind gusts, but in the dark, couldn't see anything. The next afternoon, there was a news report of one dead after falling from a ridge during a military exercise. It was from the summit ridge line that we were heading for. I heard that man fall. Back in 2015, I was on a hiking trail in Arizona. I've hiked a lot in worse terrains in Europe, so I wasn't too worried about doing it alone. It was almost getting dark, and I was at an eerily deserted stretch for what felt like hours now. Suddenly I heard a kind of music. As I kept going, I realized that it was someone whistling. It gave me the creeps, but the idea of company relieved me a bit too. Soon enough, I saw a man in front of me walking the same direction. He was wearing a t-shirt and pants, which was surprisingly inadequate, especially for the impending night. I passed him by. He was the one whistling indeed, turned to say the customary greetings. He looked up, dead pan, and without a word turned back down towards the ground and kept whistling. He was walking slowly on an almost trance-like manner. I quickly averted my gaze forward, and almost abruptly the whistling stopped. I turned back to see what happened, and there was absolutely no one on the trail. Zilch. Didn't even feel like anyone had been there. Needless to say, I freaked out. I made it back without any further issues, but I still think about what I saw and heard that night. I had a stare off with a bobcat. I awoke early before dawn and made a cup of coffee, then took a quiet walk among the huge boulders around my camp. I came around one of them and locked eyes with a large kitty, probably 45 pounds, who froze in place as I did. We were about six to seven feet apart. His eyes dilated. He crouched, ears back, and we stared deep into each other's eyes. I was afraid that if I dropped eye contact, he'd spring at my throat. He looked freaked and defensive, ready to fight. 
he was probably thinking the same thing about me. After no movement from either of us for way too long, I took a risk and dropped my eyes and head for less than a second. When I glanced around, he was gone. Poof, like a ghost. My dog right at my side had no clue. Never saw it, smelled it, or chased it. I was not surprised by my dog's ability to be fooled by the cat's perfect natural camouflage. But not to smell it? It was right in front of his face. There was a huge mountain lion up in the Three Sisters Wilderness area. His territory is large. My doctor saw it across the road and said it was gigantic. On a solo backpacking trip up the wilderness boundary, I found big cougar tracks where it had leapt after a deer or elk during the chase. The paw prints were about 20 feet apart, and I camped there for the night. I was hiking alone with my dog. It was at the beginning of the hike, so I was still very close to a town. I met a family walking together. A man, a woman, and a kid. The man says hi to me, and it's obvious that he wants to talk, so I stop. Assuming he wants to ask about my dog's breed or something. My dog smells him, and he says to my dog, Ah, you know who the master is here. What the heck? Then he asks me, are you not afraid to walk alone? I tell him, no, I'm not. Then he asks me, are you sure? You're a young woman alone. Are you not afraid of being attacked? Well, now I am, thanks. I tell him that I'm close to town, so no. He then told me how I shouldn't be without a man and keeps asking me, are you not scared of being assaulted or killed by someone? At this point, I wanted to ask him if by someone he meant him. I pointed out that I had a big dog with me and told him how my dog was protective and wouldn't hesitate to defend me if something goes wrong, which is true, but I mostly said it to scare him in case he had bad intentions. I made eye contact with the woman and kid at some point, and it was obvious that they were embarrassed. Eventually I left, and I never saw them again. This all took place in a rural area in France, not a place that's especially dangerous for women. Another scary thing is that I saw a scary, massive boar. It took me a minute to understand what that creature was. But that's not as scary as the creepy dude. I got stalked by a family of brown bear on a trail once. Thankfully, they mostly kept their distance, but they were definitely following me and I couldn't figure out why, other than that they were potentially starving and I was potentially dinner. Turns out, I had a massive bag of homemade trail mix in my pack and carried it with me on the hike instead of leaving it in the bear bag back at camp. I found it when I stopped to have some water, and at that point, the bears were getting ballsy. Closer and closer each time I tried to take a break, I dumped that trail mix out where I sat and climbed up the nearest cliff. If those bears went right for the trail mix, they didn't follow me further. It's how keen their sense of smell is. Black bear wouldn't have really concerned me. They're super skittish creatures. Brown bear, on the other hand, I don't know why, but those creatures don't give a crap and will tear you limb from limb looking for a single gummy vitamin that you forgot in your pocket. In the late 90s, I was in my junior year of high school and hiking up Usury Mountain in the East Mesa, Arizona, with my best bud and two girls that we liked. We reached the wind cave at the top, but wanted to keep going, so we scrambled up the summit to take in the view. My friend was sitting on a rock and noticed an old rusty Altoids tin box and picked it up. Inside were two folded up pieces of white paper, which he spread out on the rock. 
The first page was a crude sketch of the view from the exact spot drawn in pencil, with the caption, the last view from name's eyes, with the date. I believe it was only some months or a year past. The second page was an apology letter, listing people in this person's life and things they were sorry to have said or did to them. We surmised that it was a self-unaliving note and started searching the backside of usury for anything, something, remains, clothes, more clues. There was nothing. This was the late 90s, and internet search was not really a thing yet, so we went to the Central Mesa Library to sort through the microfish files, skimming through newspapers a little after the date, on the drawing, or any lost person notices or any news related, and again, nothing. But it was fun feeling like I was in Encyclopedia Brown for an afternoon. Some years later, my friend moved to another part of the United States and hasn't really kept in touch. But I often wonder if he still has the 10, and if he ever found the person's identity using modern research methods. Unsatisfying end to the story, I know, but it was definitely a little creepy and a little sad. Plus, I gotta use the word microfish. East Mesa has a surprising amount of culty aspects that I experienced growing up. I should probably write them all down. I was hiking in northern Ontario through an old mining road. Years of neglect had fallen tons of trees. My partner and I had 27 pound packs on, so ducking or going over fallen trees was time consuming and tiring. We got to the point on the trail where we needed to go south to the lake. There was a beach there we spotted on Google Earth. Thinking nothing of it, we head straight through the forest. No path. For those that have been through boreal forest, you know what I'm talking about. I'm up front for the first part. I step near a conifer truck. I'm two feet away from the trunk, but my foot disappears into a hole. I don't lose my balance and quickly recover, but use the nearby stick to poke around the area. It's just a fake top with broken branches and brown pine needles. Don't know how far it went down. Came to the realization there are a lot of holes in this forest. We kept our distance from any other conifer trunks and made it safely to our destination. It was worth the hike, and we made it safely home. If something bad had happened, we were many miles away from the main road and tough hauling back through the old mining road. Great memory, but it was scary. I posted a review on all trails for a snowshoe I did in the mountains. I was the first one up that trail after a pretty good sized snowstorm, breaking trail pretty much the whole way. A couple days later, somebody tracked me down on Facebook from that review and started asking questions. I thought it was kind of weird, but it turned out that she was trying to track down a guy who had hiked down the trail a few days before. He went up with just his dog and basic gear, but no snowshoes, and got caught in the storm. The storm was so powerful that it shut down a ski hill in the area. Total whiteout. Dropped a lot of snow very fast. The dog showed up on the highway 10 miles away, two days later. I was the next person up the trail after him, so they were hoping I'd seen some sign of him, but I hadn't. Turned out he would died up there. Most likely he'd gotten off trail in the whiteout, got bogged down in the deep snow and froze. Moral of the story is be prepared out there, especially in the mountains, double especially in the winter. I was a volunteer working at a camp in Velapohe, Albania. One night, my friends and I decided to go to some beach bars to party. We bar hopped a little and eventually ended up in a one a bit too far from camp, 
a bit further from the coast behind a big forest. When 2 a.m. hit the clock, I felt tired, so I decided to go back to the camp. No one else was willing to, so I ended up walking alone. I decided to take a shortcut through the forest. It was pitch dark, so I used the flashlight on my phone. I illuminated the path and then I saw it. It was a body. I startled and started moving the light slowly, only to reveal ten more bodies lying on the ground. Fortunately, all of those bodies were alive, just sleeping. It turned out that the forest was full of homeless gypsies who were just living there. I was relieved that no one was dead, but I was also a bit scared of being robbed. Obviously, I don't mean to be racist, but one of those guys are fine and nice, but also poor and unfortunate. They were usually making a living by playing music on nearby beaches. However, at the same time, I saw their children pickpocketing the tourists. But the night got even scarier. When I left the forest safely, I started walking on the promenade. I started looking at the stars as the night sky in Bellahohe is simply gorgeous. I was passing a lot of rabid dogs on the way. I didn't think much of it at the moment because they were just scavenging near the rubbish bins and piles and just kept walking. Suddenly, I start feeling uneasy. Something wasn't right. I turned around and wouldn't you know it, the dogs were following me. The pack was getting larger and larger and it wasn't just a funny parade with cute puppies. They started forming an open circle formation, just like hunting wolves in movies. I immediately started walking a bit faster, looking around for any large stick to defend myself. The dogs accelerated their pace as well. Encouraged by their numbers, some of them started growling. Then I heard loud barking and tapping. I quickly turned around and saw one of the dogs charging me with about 10 to 15 dogs walking behind it quietly or growling. I did the only thing I could think of, which was shouting and stomping aggressively. That immediately discouraged the pack. All the 10 to 15 dogs stopped and looked at me quietly, still remaining in the circle formation. The charging one retreated and barked even louder, probably to cover its lack of courage. I slowly turned my back and started walking, but then the dog charged me again. And again, I shouted and tried to look aggressive. This worked again and became a routine for the rest of my way back to camp, which was fortunately just 10 more minutes. Needless to say, I was very scared that I was going to be eaten or at least severely bitten by a pack of wild dogs. But thank God, nothing bad truly happened. I like to hike solo. One time I was hiking around a trail system at the base of my local mountain with my two dogs, not far from civilization and not a technical trail. It was really more of a walk in the woods. I had hiked that trail many times before, almost daily. The worst part of the trail was when you had to pass by this little lean-to that someone had put against a pine tree, maybe 150 feet off the side of the trail. I always got creeped out by it because someone easily could have been in it, but after having walked the trail so many times, I got pretty acclimated to it. Well, lo and behold, this time my fears came true. This time, a lumbering, jacked, unkempt man with a very unhinged look in his eyes and a huge machete comes striding out of the lean-to as I'm passing by. I'm a pretty small gal, I'm completely unarmed, and I'm completely unprepared for this. He starts walking alongside me, very close to me, telling me how he had just been released from prison, how lonely he is, how confused he is about having to get back on his feet after spending time locked up, how angry he is at everyone for letting bad things happen to him. My heart is beating out of my chest, but I manage to stay calm on the exterior. There's no one around to scream for. There's no way that I'm going to overpower this guy. I'm at a total loss about the right thing to do. I just gently and kindly talk to him about his troubles, share about what I was going to do with the rest of my day, which includes going home to my family, and eventually I'm able to tell him that I need to turn around 
and head back because I'm running out of time. At which point, he just books it back deeper into the woods. He easily could have assaulted and murdered me at that moment. I have no idea what kept him from causing me any harm. But I am grateful. Years ago, I was taking a short hike around a lake where I lived, something I must have done a hundred times before. Nice day, but during the middle of the week, so no one else was around. About ten minutes into it, I got the sense of someone behind me and turned around. When I did, I saw a man about thirty feet behind me walking very quickly in my direction, with his eyes right on me. Strange thing was that as soon as I turned around and looked at him, he immediately turned around and walked back the way he had come. I got the creepiest sensation that I had been in immediate danger from the guy and that the man turned back the other way because he had lost the element of surprise. I waited about 20 or so minutes and then got out of there. I still wonder what would have happened if I hadn't turned around. My best friend and I went for an early trail run one morning in the summer. Ours were the only cars in the parking lot, and there are no other trailheads for miles. As we were running up the mountain, we noticed something ahead of us. A tall person was walking very slowly toward us, swishing their arms in front of them side to side. It was a hot day, and he was wearing a hooded jacket. Their sleeves were long enough to touch the ground, and their hood was tied over their face so they must have only had a small hole to look out of. We passed this person with no issue, but it's the creepiest encounter I've ever had on a trail. I learned that I'm definitely the kind of person that would trip my friend and leave them for dead if the moment called for it. I was hiking Cerro Chaparro in Costa Rica last May, 42 kilometer trail that I started at midnight and finished at 5.30 p.m. There is a lodge at the base of the trail. Once I finished and got back, there were cops with a family there. I ate dinner and went to bed, not knowing what was going on. The next day, I found out that a woman who was hiking with two family members had disappeared on the hike. She had apparently been hiking ahead of the other two for a short period when they heard her scream. When they caught up to where she had been, she wasn't there or anywhere to be found. They searched and called out as long as possible until they had to head down the trail to seek help. They found her body four days later. She had fallen off of a large cliff. Turns out, I passed her dead or dying body unknowingly at some point on the hike. A buddy of mine and I were hiking Mount Washington in October. We are seasoned and prepared hikers. It was a windy cold day, but we had a great time. Managed to also bag Monroe between sets of clouds, just obscuring everything. We knew that we'd be hiking in the dark and planned accordingly. We were hiking down the Jewel Trail with the headlamps on, and out of the darkness we hear, hello. My buddy and I basically both crapped ourselves. Setting there is a young woman and her boyfriend in sneakers and light jackets freezing. No backpacks, no water, no nothing. We start to ask questions and they only speak French. My buddy thankfully is a native speaker, so we get the whole story. They started hiking up Jewel at 3 p.m. From there, they managed to fumble around and then they lost the light. This was 2008, so smartphones weren't terrible, but not great. It didn't take them long to blow their batteries out trying to use them as flashlights. Too afraid to go down the hill in the dark, they did the sensible thing and just stopped and stayed on the trail. We gave them water and food in our spare layers and started back down the trail. 
We got them back to their car, and they thanked us profusely. I always wondered how people could die in the whites. This was the first time seeing how unprepared people will gleefully go down the trail without a care. When I was 11, I went camping with my mom, her boyfriend, and my little brother outside of Las Vegas in the middle of the desert. We went arrowhead hunting one morning, and during our hike, we stumbled upon a full human skeleton laying on a blanket, kind of tucked under a bush, laying on their back like they fell asleep and never woke up. My boyfriend knelt down and prayed over the remains, and then we walked back to the campsite silent, everyone in complete shock. Got the ranger boyfriend got into helicopter to show him where the remains were. Turned out to be a presumed self-unaliving of a young male. He had been missing for almost a year. It was suspicious that the whole skeleton was still in contact, though. That image is forever burned in to my brain. Back in the early 90s, I did an overnight small chunk of the Appalachian Trail with two work friends. It was rainy, miserable. I had a cheap sleeping bag and an ancient external frame backpack that made me worry about being a lightning rod at that elevation. We got lost on the way out and started complaining to each other and settled into grumpy silence. We hadn't seen anything the whole time, but then we could hear somebody coughing like a really wet, croupy, hacking cough. Turns out, it was a single adult man and a kid. They were wearing rain gear, but didn't otherwise seem outfitted for even a short jaunt, like us, much less a longer hike. The kid looked miserable, just coughing and coughing, and we passed each other in silence. I was basically a kid myself, maybe 19, but the older I have gotten, the more that I think about this five-minute snippet of my life. I have kids now. That child had glassy eyes and a flushed face. A sure sign of fever. His hair was stuck to his face from the rain. I still remember that sad little resigned look in his eyes as we passed. We were miles and miles from any kind of access point or way station. I never would just keep walking now. The dad, I really hope it was their dad at least, and I would have had a frank conversation. Did they need help? Dry socks? A snack? Was he aware that his kid needed to get off the trail ASAP? Etc. I still think about it. A lot. I've got three crazy experiences. In college, my buddy and I are camping at the Mount Washington lean-tos to have three days of spring skiing at Tuckerman's Ravine. If you don't know the area, there's no lifts. You hike up a very steep and relatively short run. The camping is two to three hours from the parking lot. We wake up to a beautiful morning with not a cloud in the sky. Unfortunately, the service report says 50 mile per hour winds at the ski area. The mountain has the highest wind speeds recorded on Earth. We decided to take a short hike and then hopefully ski in the afternoon. After an hour, we can still see the lean-to. Clouds roll in, and it's a complete whiteout blizzard. We're above the tree line with no markers. We end up coming down the wrong side, hiking for hours in sometimes chest-deep snow. We finally hit a road and walk another few hours and find a motel. We beg for a room and after some cajole and get one. The next morning, we hitchhike 20 miles back to the base parking lot, climb up for hours to get our skis and camping gear. There's a raging windstorm at the lean-tos, and we have to ski slide, slip down the icy trail to the parking lot. A few years later, my girlfriend, now wife, are cross-country skiing in Vermont in the spring. It's a one-way trip from a car we left back to my brother's car. 
We have a map and compass, and we're following the long trail markers on the trees. It has recently snowed, so it's only our tracks. The prior summer, the trail has been moved, not on our map, but they leave up some of the old tree markers. We become lost and decided to settle in for the night. I dug a deep pit to build a fire. At about 10, the pit collapsed and put the fire out. It's pitch black and we dug out some snow caves, but my inner brain was rebelling. Just then the moon rose and I could strap on the skis and collect more firewood. We were rescued by volunteer snowmobilers. My brother had called the police at about 3 a.m. It took three hours to get us back to our car. Lastly, we were hiking in the Angeles National Forest and I had a baby in a backpack. We saw a mountain lion. My wife yelled run, but I calmed her quickly and we slowly backed away. When we were a safe distance away, she took the baby like a football and sprinted down the trail. I saw her meet a small group coming up. When I got to her, I asked if she had warned them and she said coldly, no, I wanted to have someone between us and the lion. Her maternal instinct seemed to have overrode common courtesy. Thankfully, there was nothing on the news that evening. I grew up in Orange County, California, but there were some real wild areas around us, believe it or not. In high school, we went to this place called Black Star Canyon in the Cleveland National Forest. Big, densely wooded area of oak that stretches from OC to San Diego, almost to the border. Even contains Marine Corps Camp, Camp Pendleton. Anyway, we had been told that it was haunted growing up. Turns out, true story, there was a tribe up there that was slaughtered in the 1800s by hired fur trappers because they kept stealing the Mexican ranchers' horses for meat. Enough said for a bunch of dumb high schoolers, so we plan a night hike to this place. My friends and I did stuff like this all the time, but I consider myself pretty skeptical, and luckily most of us were pretty level-headed. The area is pretty well known for mountain lions too, so we were all on guard and in agreement to turn around at any given sign even if it was just one of us wanted to. So the way the trail works, you park at a forestry gate and start to walk a long asphalt narrow road that's mostly dirt from where there were sparse houses in the 50s and 60s before the floods washed them out and the land was committed to National Forest Service. Eventually, turning to full hiking trail. Along this road is a line of barbed wire as well with all kinds of signs warning you not to cross. So here we are, typical idiots walking on a road on a hardly slivered moon, pitch black night after midnight and not using our flashlights to add to the flare. Well, as we go and adventure deeper and deeper down this road, which we'd never been on before, mind you, I keep seeing what appears to be a cowboy leaning on the wooden fence posts, holding the barbed wire, just kind of leaning on it, but distinctly looking at us. I'm talking full-blown cowboy-brimmed hat, just leaning, but it's just a silhouette out the side of my eye, and every time I look straight on, there's nothing. I'm telling myself if I'm logical and push it off as a trick of the eyes to keep my cool, but I keep seeing this guy every ten or so posts, but I don't say a thing to the guys. We get to a point where we've been walking for over an hour and debate on heading back just because of the time. Then my friend goes, yeah, and I keep thinking I'm seeing a cowboy along the fence line. No crap, I felt my stomach drop out of me. I couldn't believe it. These were plain wooden fence posts, maybe a typical four foot or so tall, with mostly field behind them. No way that that looks like a person. So I open up about it also, and we all agree to turn around. Just then, my other buddy starts flipping out ripping his shirt off and screaming about getting stung. We're all kind of confused looking at him like he's crazy, but he insists that a bee or something just stung him. So we turn our lights on his back to look and watch as three distinct scratches form, stretching from his shoulder diagonal to the opposite hip, 
even drawing blood. We were done, needless to say, after that, but made it back to the car without further incident. You can probably argue that the shadow was a coincidence in the dark, and shapes playing tricks, sure, I'll give you that. But throw in the scratch in a way that we watched happen right as we're discussing this cowboy, and in a way we couldn't do to himself, and none of us standing in a circle did it to him. I believe there was something going on. This area ended up being used by Jack Osborne's show, Haunted Highway, on his pilot episode. It's pretty cool, and I've been back since, but only in the day. California has more to it than you'd imagine. This is just one story out of many that I've experienced out here. I was walking through a not so popular or well-known trail. It wasn't marked very well, so we got turned around a few times and there really wasn't a lot of signs that people went on this trail often. Most paths were tough to see if they were even trails or were just wandering. Then we saw what looked like a dense area of trees and what looked like a path, so we head straight towards it. It was a well-traveled path, just in this little area. We take a turn and see some strange, shiny, reflective objects in the tree. We cautiously round the turn. And then as far as we could see, about 30 yards on the only straight path were Christmas ornaments. I mean, there had to be hundreds of them. Really creepy ones and some standard. Some look personal. But it wasn't the oddity of some of them that was the sheer amount of them on an unmarked trail in the middle of the woods after we got turned around a bit. That was probably the weirdest stuff I've ever experienced. Looked it up on all the trails after we made it out and there were no comments on that trail about Christmas ornaments. The hiking path was along a small stream. During heavy rain, that stream would turn from a two meter wide shallow creek into a 20 meter wide river. So it wasn't unusual to come across random trash that had been washed downstream. First, I passed a child's lunchbox, then a small jacket or sweater, then a child's backpack with a name and address prominently printed on it with permanent marker, then a plastic garbage can. You can clearly see that there was something in the can. It was wrapped in black garbage bags, but they were torn so you could see what looked like clothing underneath. It was pretty far out, so I wanted to make sure before turning around and calling the police. Thankfully, it was just a bag of garbage. I was hiking out of a canyon and as I approached the mouth of it, I heard a repetitious thumping noise that got louder and louder the closer I got to the mouth. Standing at the mouth of the canyon, I started looking around for what the source of the noise might be. I had some binoculars, and as I scanned up above the canyon, I spotted someone dressed in a grim reaper costume beating a drum. I have no idea what was going on. This isn't my story, but it's one that someone told me. They were in some very, very remote part of California and were about to enter a forest. Near the edge, close to a rock and behind some trees, were two people wearing all white, a man and a woman. They simply stared. When he tried to say hi and greet them, they didn't respond, but instead just kept on staring. This was in the morning. At night, he noticed his food was missing and there were two human footprints that went all around his tent. Three days later, he hears whispering around his tent in the middle of the night. 
Another day later, as he keeps looking back because of the previous incident, he sees two white dots following him about three miles behind him. They followed him for around a hundred miles. That night, he purposefully hid his tent far off the trail. They still found him and lit a light directly at the tent. Dude took off running and they proceeded to chase him. Eventually, he hid and could see them with their flashlight just looking for him. He left all of his gear and eventually got to a town where he contacted the police. The police said that similar incidents had occurred from different people, yet they never found anyone. People were also mysteriously disappearing in the forests. Dude made it out and went back home. I saw a full YouTube about it from Mr. Ballin. It definitely gave me the chills. Just today, my friend and I were hiking on some abandoned and used land. It's really beautiful, with lakes, cliffs, and tons of trees. The hike was going really well. But close to dark, it turned around. My friend whispered to me that they had been thinking of skinwalkers and couldn't stop. This got me thinking of the same, and we decided to head back to the car to eliminate any risk. A few minutes into the hike back, we both got horrible feelings, and it became apparent that we were not alone. We kept making our way back to the car as fast as we could, but it kept getting worse. Both of us experienced blurred vision and the air suddenly got thick and had a hum to it. It also became incredibly hard to move, and we both experienced an intense urge to lay down and stop hiking. We came across an area we hadn't hiked through, but was adjacent to the where we were. And there were so many deer prints in every direction, as if deer had been rapidly pacing there, and human footprints on the other side of that scramble. There wasn't a clear starting point to the footprints, and no evidence of any other hikers for miles. The trek back to the car seemed to take five minutes and three hours simultaneously, so we have no clue how long it actually took. Neither of us have felt this sense of dread or have been this disoriented before. Do you think we had a close encounter with a skinwalker, or was it something else entirely? I don't have the background knowledge to say exactly what it could be, we're in eastern Kansas if that helps. Any information or ideas are appreciated. Note, I'm not trying to offend anyone in my story. I'm simply telling the events that I experienced. My friend was thinking of skinwalkers, and I am simply looking for advice or ideas as to what I could have experienced. Whatever it was, it was very scary and not a good experience. I said in my post that I did not have the knowledge or experience to claim it to be anything specific, and I hope that doing so would clarify that I was not trying to offend anyone. Thank you to all who have given ideas or kind criticisms of my wording. I really appreciate all of it. I was hiking in Willamot National Forest on a trail that I am very familiar with. I have my two dogs with me, a hound and a lab, and we had just got up a really steep hill and I sat down for a rest. My dogs are usually just cruising around, sniffing out little critters and enjoying themselves. Suddenly one of my dogs starts growling and staring down the trail where we had just come from. Just like that. They both get up right next to me and start to growl, staring down the trail. It's not a particularly bushy area, so I can see pretty far and I don't see anything. But the dogs were sure that there was something there and I believed them, maybe a cougar. After a while, they calmed down and we kept going and looped back on another trail. I had a pocket knife with me that I carried out for the next few miles but we got back okay. They have never acted like that before or since.
This happened yesterday. My brother and I went for a hike to stave off cabin fever from self-isolating. We chose a pretty remote trail to lower the risk of coming into contact with other people. I was walking ahead of my brother, and the gravel on the track was making our footsteps sound really loud. Deep in thought, I was listening to the rhythm of his footsteps behind me. About 20 minutes in, I started hearing other footsteps starting off faint and getting louder, until they were the same pitch as his, but they were much faster, like a running rhythm. They suddenly came to a halt, and I could hear the motion of someone stopping on gravel. That sudden, sharp, rocky sound, if you can imagine it. I assumed there must have been someone running or jogging on the track, and sure enough, I saw a shadow to the side of me appear, which looked like a person's head next to mine, as though they were right behind me. I stopped and turned to let them pass because the track was narrow. However, when I turned around, it was just my brother staring back at me. He was confused as to why I'd stopped, so I asked if he was running a second ago and he said no. I asked if there had been anyone behind him, and he said that he wasn't aware of anyone. I thought it was strange, but just let it go and carried on. About five minutes later, we came around a corner and there was this smell of just pure death, like a really strong off-meat smell. We figured it was a dead animal and kept going. We reached the hike lookout about 20 minutes later, chilled out for a bit and then headed back. We passed the death smell, and then around the exact spot where it happened before, I started hearing running sounds again. I ignored it this time because it was starting to freak me out, and just picked up the pace to get back to the car. I told my mom, and she joked that the death smell must have been a dead jogger, and I was being haunted by them to which I laughed at the time. But now I'm wondering, what if it was? Maybe I should have investigated the smell. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep everyone, and I'll read to you in the next video. Bye bye now.